Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Oppel from the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Uh, it was my pleasure to work on this legislation related to compounding pharmacies. The, bills were spon the bill was sponsored by Senator Joe Hewn and supported by our Attorney General Bill Schutte. It's now Public Act 280 of 2014. And with your reminder email earlier today at about 1130, there was a link to a wonderful advisory bulletin prepared by our speaker today, Kathy Reed from DICOMA. So you should have uh, that material to either follow along with or review later on. I want to take just a minute to thank Paige Fultz, who's with us here today. Paige did a fantastic job on staffing this legislation. We had a lot of changes that we, we believe we were successful in creating a bill that while we might not have welcomed it, at least it's better for hospitals than it would have been as introduced. And that was no small feat as people thought this was just kind of a slam dunk related to the New England Compounding Center's criminal activities. Uh, there was very little interest in how we would make this uh, different because everybody was really reacting to that terrible situation that ended up uh, infecting so many people uh, in Michigan. Just to follow up on what Amanda said, please put your phone on mute. Uh, please do not put your phone on hold. We will hear your hold music. If you need to uh, take another call, disconnect and call back in. That will be available. Um, I don't think there's any other housekeeping. With that, uh, again, Kathy Reed from Dykema Law Firm is here. She did the advisory bulletin that you see, and I'm um, going to turn it over to her to go through the materials. This webinar, both in terms of her presentation, uh, the visual presentation and the audio presentation, is being recorded, and we will make it available online later, uh, and we will send that link out to all of you as well so that you can share it with your other colleagues. We don't have the entire uh, hospital contingent uh, across Michigan on the line, but I'm sure there's other people that will want to watch this later. So with that, thanks very much to Kathy Reed for your work, and I'll let you go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for the opportunity to present this information to your members. Um, I am an attorney with Dyke McGasset. I'm also a registered nurse, but um, I'm not a pharmacist. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you know about actually implementing this law. And I'll make a uh, little confession here: pharmacology was not my favorite subject in nursing school. Although I happen to do a lot of work now having to do with drugs. I do a lot of work with um, NPIA own use. Um, Prescription Drug Marketing Act, 340B, and then this compounding material too. So um, uh, I, I am, I do a lot of work in the pharmacy area, though I certainly um, respect your expertise. In fact, I always tell people, my colleagues that I love having pharmacists as clients because they're extremely compliance oriented, <laughs> unlike a lot of the other, you know, <coughs> healthcare professionals that we work with, I find that pharmacists like to know what the rules are and they like to follow the rules, which makes my job very easy. Um, today we're going to talk about the new federal and state um, compounding pharmacy laws. And, oh, I should advance my slide, sorry, thank you. Um, historically, uh, drug compounding was done on a relatively small scale. Um, a lot of hospital pharmacies did it um, in-house. Uh, then there was an increased demand for compounded drugs, and largely because there became drugs available that, um, that <clears throat> you could deliver IV, IV push, that um, needed to be compounded. And so there was um, an increased amount of compounding that was going on sort of in advance of getting a patient-specific prescription. So we were um, in, uh, the FDA tried to deal with it on, on uh, in its way in 1997 by implementing the um, Section 503 of the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which dealt with, uh, it created sort of a safe harbor for pharmacies that compounded. They didn't have to follow the new drug um, application rules. They didn't have to label um, compounded drugs with instructions for adequate use. And then also they didn't have to follow the current good manufacturing uh, practices rules. Um, however, in 2002, there was case law that uh, there was a case brought to challenge the constitutionality of certain provisions of 503A that had to do with 
um, advertising, and those were held unconstitutional. So it created a problem in that here the FDA had this compounding law in the books, but now part of it was unconstitutional, and there was sort of a split in authorities about whether that meant all of 503A was unconstitutional or um, just those advertising things. So you were left with very, very weak, unclear um, regulation on a federal level um, and very minimal pharmacy board oversight, especially if the compound that was drawn in advance of um, a prescription. So that led to a lot of unsafe practices and, some hub and actually some public health emergencies like we saw with the New England um, compounding company in 2012. Um, so what happened after that, uh, after that crisis was that uh, Congress enacted the Drug Quality and Security Act of 2013. Um, whoops, wrong way. Yeah, there we go. 2013. And Title I of that was the Compounding Quality Act. Title, the second title of it is the track and trace stuff that we're not going to talk about today, but um, that's the security part. Um, the Compounding Quality Act contained two sections, was, which was 503A, which was the existing law. And all they did to that, they added some things, but the primary thing that they did with 503A was got rid of those unconstitutional advertising prohibitions so that now the FDA could enforce the entire 503A with confidence. It also created a new Section 503B that had to do with outsourcing facilities, which is a new type of compounding entity. Um, I'll talk a little bit about those in this presentation, although that's not the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. It created a new um, voluntary registration category. Um, they have to, I'll show you a chart in the next, uh, then there was also, I'll, before I go to that chart, just mention also that um, in 2014, this year, the state of Michigan amended its pharmacy licensure laws, which is what Laura was talking about, and we got some new, um, new regulation of compounding pharmacies. Uh, I'll talk more about the Michigan statute later in the presentation, but um, going now to sort of a scheme um, of the um, federal compounding law. What we ended up with then is sort of three categories of entities that can do compounding and different levels of regulation of those entities. First, the compounding pharmacies. Those are the 503A entities. Uh, there's no regis federal registration for those. Um, they, do not, uh, they do need to have a prescription. They're not subject to current good manufacturing practices. They do not have to label for, with instructions for adequate use and they don't need to have a, um, a new drug approval every time they create a compounded drug. Then moving up the level of regulation is the outsourcing facility. That's the new type of facility under 503B. Um, there is voluntary federal registration. Um, there, no prescription is required in order to, be, to do compounding as an outsourcing facility. However, you do have to follow current good manufacturing practices. You do not have to use, um, have to do adequate um, instructions for use labeling. Um, there are some labeling requirements, but not those specifically. And there is the, um, uh, you do not need new drug approval. Then finally, the, the, the most regulated would be the um, drug manufacturers. Drug manufacturers also do compounding. Um, they, you must register with the federal government if you are, uh, if you are a uh, drug manufacturer. Uh, you don't need a prescription to manufacture, but you do have to follow those other three requirements, the uh, GMP, adequate labeling use, and new drug approval um, requirements. So if you do not register as an outsourcing facility and you're doing compounding, then you need to be either following 503A as a compounding facility or you need to register as a drug manufacturer. So. Uh, let's get a little bit more in depth on the 503A. 503A is really sort of a safe harbor. It exempts, um, it exempts compounding pharmacies from the following three requirements of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. First, they don't have to file, they don't have to follow good manufacturing practices. They don't have to label the drugs with adequate instructions for use, and they don't have to get uh, pre-market approval for the drugs that they compound. Now, the FDA issued in July of this year um, guidance on 503A. 
Um, it was issued by the Office of Compliance and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. That's a good document to get. It's available on the FDA's website. There's a whole section on compounding in the FDA's website. If you're interested, you can go to this. It's short. It's pretty concise. Um, it's not applicable to outsourcing facilities, only to pharmacies um, that are doing compounding. And they are sort of a place, this guidance is sort of a placeholder until the FDA issues a lot of, um, 503A requires the FDA to issue quite a few regulations, and we'll talk about some of those as we go through this. But um, uh, that's a good, it's a short document, it's an easy to read document, and I would recommend it to anybody. Okay, let's go through what exactly are the requirements for compounded drugs that fall, would be able to fall within that 503A safe harbor. First of all, there has to be a valid prescription or order for an identified patient. Now, the law does give you some leeway in how you get that or how long you, you need to have it or when you get it, I should say. Um, you can either have it in hand when you do the compound, in other words, you're doing it with an individual prescription in hand, or you can do it in advance of receiving an individual patient prescription if you're doing it in limited quantities. You're doing it based on a history of prescribing that of, um, and it's issued, and the prescription that you're receiving is issued solely with an, with a quote, established relationship between the person who's doing the compounding and either the patient or the prescriber. So they do allow, 503A does allow for some advanced compounding. This would be the kind of situation where you know that a physician office likes to use a lot of a certain kind of compounded drug um, based on the fact that the, p p the patients keep bringing the prescriptions for it. Maybe it's something they actually administer in the office. So you can do some limited, um, limited advanced compounding for that physician office because you've developed a relationship with that prescriber or maybe it's the patient and they, you say, hey, instead of coming in with this, can, I, can you just you know, make up a couple batches to give to my doctor? And then um, that's a, a permissible under the federal law. But you do actually eventually have to get a prescription for that. And that's what sort of distinguishes it from the outsourcing facilities and the manufacturers. Um, there's also language in 503A which talks only about a, quote, pharmacist doing, or a pharmacy doing, I should say a pharmacist or the prescriber doing the compounding. There's nothing about whether or not a pharmacist could delegate some of those compounding tasks to another individual. Um, I'm guessing that the regulations that they write eventually will address that issue, but right now that's, um, we're strictly talking about a pharmacist doing that type of thing. Going on to the other requirements for those compounded drugs, they have to be compounded in compliance with the uh, USP specifically Chapter 795 and 797. I believe 797 is the sterile compounding um, chapters. Um, I know that on the um, ASHP website, they have a tool that um, hospitals can use, and it it's sort of like a self-assessment. Um, are you ready to do to insource your own sterile compounding under this um, under this act? And it, it kind of helps step you through the, um, the requirements that you would have to meet under USP and all these other requirements that we're talking about here. Um, just kind of an, uh, a tool you can use to decide whether you're ready to do your own compounding in-house or it's still safer to do it out, outside, to do an outside contractor. Then there are several ingredient requirements listed in 503A. They're pretty specific. Um, having to do with if you're using bulk substances, they have to be, um, they have to meet the USP or National Formulary Monograph, um, or they have to be components of FDA-approved drugs, um, and then also, or the other, the third option is that they're on a list that the FDA is yet to publish. So once that list is established, that will be one of the options for you um, to use those types of bulk substances. Um, the bulk substance has to be manufactured by an FDA registered manufacturer. It has to come with a valid certificate of analysis. And as to non-bulk substances that you use in compounding, um, they have to comply with any applicable um, USP or form national formulary monogram. Uh, the the um, drug that you're compounding cannot be on the FDA's 
withdrawn or removed list. Those are drugs that they, they do not permit people to make because of safety issues. Um, more requirements for the drugs that are compound under 503A. You can't make copies of something that's commercially available, or I should say you cannot regularly make copies you know, or in inordinate amounts of those drugs. Um, so it sounds like in the regs are getting ready to tell us about um, situations in which you might be able to compound commercially available drugs, like for instance in shortage situations or um, uh, timeliness issues where you just can't get it to the patient fast enough. Um, the Michigan law you'll see later addresses those things head on in the statute, but I'm guessing that um, the way the statute, the federal statute is written is giving us some leeway in the regs for them to allow for some limited commercial copy of compounding. You cannot, um, you cannot publish a drug that is going to be on a new list that the FDA is going to um, put together, which is a list of drugs which present demonstrable difficulties for compounding where those difficulties affect the safety and the effectiveness of the drugs. Like I said, that list has not been published. That's one of the new things that the FDA is going to have to do um, under 503A that they have not quite done yet. So until that list is published, this, this part of the statute is not enforceable. And then finally, the drugs have to be, um, if, if you, the, 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 one of the purposes of the uh, 503A is to increase the channels of communication between the FDA and state boards of pharmacy so that if state boards of pharmacy know that there's a bad actor out there, there's a way and a mechanism, a channel for them to contact the FDA so the FDA can do some investigation if they think it's warranted, um, or even just to report um, adverse licensure activity to the FDA so that they're aware all the time of who the good actors and the bad actors are out there and who needs to be watched. One of the reasons that we'll talk about later is that um, uh, the FDA enforces 503 on a risk basis risk basis, uh, entities that are compounding that present the highest level of risk, and that may be because they have had some licensure issues, um, they will be more likely to be um, subject to investigation and enforcement. But anyway, going back to the state memorandum, um, one of the ways that 503A is going to increase this communication is that they anticipate that the FDA will, will publish a form of state memorandum of understanding for each board of pharmacy to issue, to sign with the FDA. And the purpose of this is to put some limits on the amount of um, drugs that one a pharmacy in one state or a compounder in one state it puts into interstate commerce, in other words, sells across state lines. Um, those MOUs will likely have their own limits, but um, if, you're, if you're compounding in a state that has not yet issued uh, or signed an MOU with the feds, um, you're going to be limited to, to only 5% of the total amount of drugs that you compound can you sell across state lines. Um, so in order, so th that's the list of the items that you need to follow. Your drugs have to meet those requirements in order for you to be eligible for the 503 um, safe harbor. In addition to those requirements, any drugs that you compound are still going to be required to, to um, aside from the safe harbor issues for the, the um, good, good manufacturing practices, the labeling, and the um, uh, uh, pre-market approval, you still have to follow all the other requirements of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So in other words, the purity requirements under the Act, the requirement that you comply with any compendium that's applicable. If, the, if that drug is recognized in any compendium, you've got to comply with that. And then you also can't, you have to follow the um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act's rules regarding false and misleading advertising. Um, so as I mentioned um, before, the safe harbor means if you fail to fall in, within the safe harbor, the FDA could hold you liable for um, for producing unalterated drugs, in other words, if you're not following good manufacturing practices, for um, you lose your protection from the new drug application um, laws, and you would also lose your protection from uh, misbranding violations because you could be held as uh, not labeling the proper instructions for adequate use. So um, if you don't meet those requirements, you lose the safe harbor, these laws would apply to you. 
the FDA, as I mentioned, is, been, is taking a risk-based um, enforcement approach. Um, if you are a more high-risk uh, uh, compounder, like you do a lot of sterile compounding, you're sending a lot of drugs into interstate commerce, you're just plain old big, um, you're more likely to feel the presence of the FDA in what you're doing. Um, what are the types of things that the FDA could do to you or uh, for you? Um, first of all, the sort of lowest low is a warning letter. You could get a warning letter. Um, you could get, they could seize product if they felt the product was unsafe. They could seek a legal injunction that would um, uh, keep you from producing the product or selling the product or distributing the product. And then finally, the most serious um, types of violations, say where there's fraud involved or where there's some sort of harm to patients, um, those would be subject to criminal prosecution. But the FDA has a quite a range of um, types of enforcement actions that it can take. So let's move on now to the Michigan um, pharmacy compounding law. As Laura mentioned, in uh, 2014, this, this year, uh, Public Act 280 amended the Michigan Pharmacy Licensure and Drug Control Provisions of the Mich Michigan Public Health Code to include some new requirements for pharmacies that compound drugs. Um, this law also had some other um, aspects that don't specifically have to do with compounding, like they adjusted the pharmacist in charge provisions of the law. Um, requiring now that every licensed pharmacy has a pharmacist in charge. We had that before, but this is a little bit more strict. And setting some time limits on how much time that pharmacist in charge has to spend at the pharmacies that they're overseeing. And then um, also imposing a pharmacist in charge law on uh, drug manufacturers and drug wholesalers. Uh, as to the pharmacies, their pharmacist in charge has to be licensed in Michigan drug wholesalers and um, uh, manufacturers that just sell into Michigan, they might not be located in Michigan, their pharmacist in charge can be licensed in the state where they're located. In the state. So um, that's a new thing. It doesn't really have to do with compounding, but I know it's of interest to a lot of people um, who run pharmacies. So uh, just recently, um, MDCH uh, issued a memorandum. It was just I think you probably got it a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it. It sort of gives a summary of the new requirements of the law. That's a helpful thing. They have not issued any regulations yet, unlike the FDA, although you know their, their law is newer. Our law is newer than the FDA, so um, we haven't really started into the regulations yet. But they have issued this uh, memorandum that sort of summarizes the changes in the law. One of the things that the new law does is it clarifies the licensure requirements for entities that um, compound. Now in Michigan, entities which compound must be licensed either as a pharmacy or a drug manufacturer. And that, that is going to be um, along with your regular biennial um, licensure, you'll check that box and if you look at, if you've had occasion to look at the new um, to look at the pharmacy license applications, they now have a box for a compound so that you can indicate that you're doing it. Um, if you're licensed as a pharmacy, you also have to meet the compounding requirements. Um, the other thing, interesting thing that Michigan did, which not all states have done, is that um, if you are registered as an outsourcing facility under the federal law, under 503B, state, and you're operating in Michigan, Michigan is going to require you to be licensed as a pharmacy. That was one of the, the sort of um, selling points or, or interesting, nice things about the outsourcing uh, facility regulation was that the federal law was not requiring you to be licensed as a pharmacy in your state. But Michigan is doing that. So in other words, and now in Michigan, even if you are a licensed, a, a registered outpatient outsourcing facility, you need to be licensed either as a pharmacy or a drug manufacturer. So there's no outsourcing facility only in Michigan. And I checked the FDA's list of registered outsourcing facilities yesterday, and there were no Michigan entities listed on there. Yeah, I saw one in Ohio. I know there's one in Illinois, I think, but um, nobody in Michigan yet has registered as an outsourcing facility. 
The new statute has some uh, new definitions, too. It now gives a clearer definition of compounding pharmacy, just meaning a pharmacy that a licensed pharmacy which is authorized to provide compounding services that meets the requirements of the code. Pretty self-explanatory. They also define compounding to mean preparation and mixing, assembling, packaging, or labeling of a drug or device by a pharmacist in, follow, in the following circumstances. And the circumstances has, have to do with the prescription. Um, you can either have the prescription, the patient-specific prescription, um, at, you know, um, in hand when you do it, or in anticipation of the receipt of a prescription or order based on the routine, regularly observed prescription or order patterns of the um, prescriber. Um, it's a little bit different than what we saw in 503A, which talked about the, quote, established relationship. As a practical matter, I don't know if there's going to be any fallout from that difference. Probably not, because I don't know how you regularly observe uh, practice patterns unless you're in sort of an established relationship with somebody. Um, but uh, under both this definition and 503A, we're still talking about a situation where you actually eventually get a prescription <clears throat> from the pa for the patient. One thing that I didn't put down here is, and um, I also included in this, um, you don't you can do it with the, pa the prescription in hand or in anticipation of receipt, um, or if you're doing it incidental to research, teaching, or chemical analysis, you don't need to have a prescription for it, but you're still considered compounding. Um, compounding definition specifically excludes certain activities, and that is the preparation of commercially available drugs with certain exceptions that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the preparation of allergenic extracts or biologicals are not included as compounding. And just the regular mixing or reconstitution of a drug in accordance with packaging instructions, like you might reconstitute a powder drug. That's not considered compounding. I'm going to come back to this slide because I want to go all the way through um, the requirements of the Michigan law so we can have a better understanding of what the issues are here. It's kind of a questionable area. Um, the, the new law does allow for some, um, what some people call bulk or advanced compounding. I don't really like advanced, although you see it a lot because advanced sounds like uh, you're going to eventually going to get a prescription, but um, really in this situation, they're allowing you to do some compounding without a prescription in limited qualities, quantities, but only if you meet certain requirements. First of all, you have to obtain an authorization from the Board of Pharmacy. Um, you can only do it for a prescriber or a, a licensed health facility or agency for that entity's own patients. In other words, you're prescribing it, you're doing the um, compounding without a prescription for a hospital, a specific hospital, um, and that hospital's only going to administer it to its own patients. Um, your compounding has to comply with the current FDA guidance regarding compounding. And then there's a lot of record keeping requirements that you keep up, um, about the drugs, how many you do, who you get your requests for, the amounts that you compound, what drugs you compound, what's the name of the facilities or prescribers that you give the drugs to. Now, as I said, this is compounding, the, the Michigan Code is allowing this comp, bulk compounding without a prescription. And when I talked last week to somebody from the Board of Pharmacy in uh, preparation for doing this presentation, he advised me that this category, um, they have not yet, first of all, made up the applications for um, doing this. But he said, we are only going to give approval to entities that are registered as outpatient um, outsourcing facilities under the FDA law. So how I have come to sort of look at this is it's not really, it's not really that much different than an outsourcing facility. It's sort of uh, Michigan's own requirements for outsourcing facilities. So in addition to things that you have to do under 503B, Michigan is going to make you register. Michigan's going to make you fill out all this paperwork. Um, and you have to get a special authorization from the state of Michigan. Um, I, I do not exactly read the code to say that, but that's what the pharmacists told me at the board, that that's what they're going to do. It makes sense, sort of, because um, 
otherwise they're sort of creating this animal that doesn't really fit under federal law. Um, it's cleaner. I think it's it's easier for everyone to figure out if we're you know if we have compounding pharmacies, outsourcing facilities, and manufacturers. It sort of keeps it all with that same paradigm for um, registration and licensure. So you do you will need to fill out um, if you want to do this kind of um, bulk compounding. You will need to fill out an application and get approval from the Michigan Department of Community Health Board of Pharmacy. Um, the statute lists the things that you're going to have to tell the Board of Pharmacy in order to get this approval. Your name, your license number, um, the name of the prescriber facility agency that's requesting the drugs, and they have to give an affidavit that says that they will only be using it for their own patients that are located in Michigan or maybe some people that just come um, across the border. You have to specify the drugs that you're planning to compound and why you need to do this compounding. Is it because uh, um, it's not commercially available, um, there's a shortage issue, there's a timeliness issue, there's a uh, uh, timeliness both and you can't get the drugs or maybe there's a short shelf life and you need to have this on stock all the time. Um, and then the statute has this, the words before receipt of prescription in it, which I think I think are a mistake because we're talking about compounding without a prescription. So I'm hoping that regulations will clear that up. Um, and then you have to be able to verify that the conditions of operation of your facility meet the USP standards and that also um, you're doing adequate sterility testing. Like I said, this application has not yet been developed by um, the Board of Pharmacy. Now, there's some, in the statute are also some restrictions on resale of uh, compounded drugs. And this is not just drugs that are compounded in bulk without a prescription. This is any compounded drug in Michigan. First of all, the prescriber slash facility slash agency that receives the um, compounded drugs cannot sell it to other prescribers, facilities, or agencies. So in other words, if you're a hospital and you get um, some compounded drugs from uh, say there's a specialty pharmacy up the road, um, you cannot sell those to another, um, you cannot sell them like for instance to a, a physician who, who is on staff at your facility or you cannot sell it to another facility. Uh, I think that stuff is also sort of handled under the Prescription Drug Marketing Act, but um, just in case there's some sort of exception there, know that under Michigan Pharmacy Compounding Law you would not be able to resell them. If you're a compounding pharmacy, you cannot um, offer excess compounded drugs to other pharmacies for sale. And I think this would apply both if you have a prescription and you just over, um, overdo it, <laughs> you make more than you need. Uh, you can't sell it to somebody else, to another pharmacy. Or if you're just doing bulk um, compounding, you need to just be selling it to the people that you told the board of pharmacy that you were going to sell it to. And then finally, uh, compounding pharmacies may not provide samples or starter, complementary starter doses of compounded drugs to any health professional. Another thing that I don't have up here, but it's sort of an interesting point is that it's not a resale, but um, the statute says that it won't give, a, uh, it's not going to allow manufacturing and, um, and pharmacy compounding to go on in the same location. So if you're a licensed manufacturer, and a licensed compounding pharmacy, you're going to have to have two separate physical locations to carry on those activities. <clears throat> um, there's also reporting requirements for compounding pharmacies in Michigan. First, the pharmacy has to notify MDCH within 30 days of any complaint that's filed against you in another state, if you're licensed in another state, any kind of investigation by the FDA or some other federal authority, or by an accrediting agency. And you'll see when we get to talking about sterile compounding, there's some accreditation requirements. So that type of um, investigation would have to be reported. And then a pharmacy has to notify MDCH within 10 days of any adverse event relating to the integrity of a drug which they compound. Um, and there's not a, I don't remember if there's a knowledge standard in there. I'm not sure how they, I guess it must be anything that you have knowledge of. Um, and But this excludes any kind of isolated allergic reactions that respond to standard um, 
you know, uh, treatment for, you know, somebody comes in with a drug reaction and they give them um, an EpiPen in the ER, they're fine. You don't have to report that kind of event. <clears throat> Um, remember we said that uh, a com compounding, um, you're, you're not permitted to compound commercially available drugs with some exceptions. And the exception um, that the Michigan law has laid out much more nicely than the federal law does is that um, there are two exceptions. One is if the commercially available drug is modified in such a way um, that produces some kind of meaningful difference for the patient that's significant. And that has to be um, in, in per the prescriber's professional opinion. You can't just decide as the pharmacist that this is going to happen, but the prescriber himself or herself needs to feel um, that this is a, a medically necessary compounding. And then you can also compound a commercially available drug if it's not available through normal distribution channels in a timely manner to meet the patient's needs. And we all know that happens a lot, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> So these things are not specified under the federal law, but they are nicely specified under the state law. Now, if you're doing compounding of sterile um, drugs, there's another uh, that is with or without a prescription. Um, there are other, a whole other set of requirements that you need to follow under the Michigan law. First of all, when you apply to do your um, compounding, you have to be able to show, uh, and this is going to be sort of phased in over time. Right now, if you are a new applicant after September 30th, you have to show that you are accredited or you're in the process of becoming accredited by a, quote, national organization approved by the Board of Pharmacy. Now, the Board hasn't, hasn't written their regs yet, so we don't know what national organizations they're going to say are, are, are sufficient for accreditation. I don't think that there's all that many out there, so their, their choices are kind of limited, but um, that hasn't been specified yet. Or you have to um, verify that you're in the process of being accredited or that you, um, in some sort of format that the board's going to say is acceptable, um, that you are in compliance with the USP requirements for sterile compounding. Starting in uh, October 1st of 2015, Entities that are already licensed will have to meet these same accreditations and USP compliance requirements. Um, you also have to follow any um, FDA standards for sterile compounding that are out there. And then you have to, um, if, you, if you're doing sterile compounding, you have to follow the same requirements that you would in Michigan for any kind of prescription that you dispense. You have to keep those very same records. Um, the exception to that is that if you are like in a healthcare system and, or entities under common legal control where you're just um, compounding certain in-house for your own, um, your own patients, you don't have to follow all those requirements. Um, in Michigan, um, if you, because of the way Michigan requires outsourcing facilities to be licensed as a pharmacy, if you're an outsourcing facility in Michigan, you're also required to meet all of the FDA sterile compounding requirements. Um, enforcement. Um, most of the, uh, most of the uh, violations of the new compounding provisions of the code are going to be considered a misdemeanor. However, if you um, are engaged in a knowing and willful violation of the compounding law, um, or you're falsifying prescriptions in order to compound large amounts, um, those will be penalized as felonies. And you can see the little categories of, um, of, of penalty, where if there's no personal injury involved, it's a small fine and, and or two years imprisonment, all the way up to um, death of a patient, 15 years imprisonment, or a $20,000 fine. Of course, we don't know yet you know, how they're going to enforce it or with, with how much vigor because uh, they don't even have the regs done or the application yet. So <clears throat> we're still waiting on that kind of thing. Oh. Okay. I want to go back to this issue. This is an issue that I hear people talking about here it is, all the time when I go to different conferences on compounding. And it's this notion of 
um, compounding for office use, which I think they mean, uh, which to me means that you're doing a lot of, um, you're doing almost bulk compounding without a prescription because you know that this physician is going to use a certain amount of um, this drug, compounded drug, in their office, you know, in a year, and you know that because they buy it from you and they use it up, or they do, or they throw it away if they buy too much. So um, the question that comes up and is always discussed when you go to these conferences is that, well, can you do that under um, can you do that under 503A? Will the federal, will the FDA allow you to do that? And the general consensus that I get. Um, from hearing people from the FDA and seeing how they're enforcing 503A is that no, you can't do that as a 503A entity, a compounding pharmacy, in a, uh, because it requires the eventual receipt of a prescription. Now, if you're, if the physician is willing to give you those prescriptions later on, then I, I guess that's not true compounding for office use, but um, the you know, risk adverse people will say no, the federal law would not allow you to do that. You'd have to be an outsourcing facility or a manufacturer. Uh, Michigan law, I think, says the same thing because it's talking about you can do it um, if you've got that prescription in hand or if you've got, you're anticipating the receipt of a prescription or order based on routine, regularly observed prescription patterns. But we're always talking about having that receipt in, that prescription in hand at some point in time. Um, where it becomes a little bit more gray, I think, is if we're talking about a large health system where you you may do, um, and you're only you're only doing it for your own patients, and say you own a lot of physician offices or physician clinics where you're administering these compounded drugs, and you know that you're always going to have eventually somebody's going to produce a medical order for that or a prescription for it. Um, you don't have it in hand ahead of time. You also are all, you know, you're all under the same control. You're probably all linked into the same electronic health record system so that you could track that stuff and who it's given to. You have a lot of more safeguards. So I think that um, in some large health facilities, um, they're more willing to do, have their pharmacy do what's considered 503A compounding, um, even if they don't have a prescription that the pharmacy entity collects later. Uh, but that's not a clear, you know, that's, that's still a gray area, um, but I think in, hopefully in regulations we'll find out if, um, if that's going to be acceptable or what level of um, extra requirements that you have to have in order to do it. But right now we're sort of still waiting to find out what, um, what how that's all going to shake out, especially in the large health systems where you have a pharmacy and clinics and offices in the same Corporation. Um, so I did. Um, that's the information I have. I noticed you'll if you receive and actually um, Laura said that you should have received the memo that goes into more detail about all these things. Um, it has my contact information in the memo. I didn't put my contact information in the PowerPoint presentation. I apologize. Don't tell the marketing people at Dicoma that I didn't do that. I won't like that. But it is in uh, my uh, email address and my phone number are in the um, in the memo. If you have any questions, and also we can talk, we can take some questions now if anybody has any. Yep. Before we open it up for questions, just a reminder: um, we will be sending out the advisory bulletin once again, the PowerPoint slides, and then this link uh, because this webinar will be up live after. So with that, we will open it up for questions in the room first, and then we will move to to the phone. And please keep your phones on mute. Um, if you're not asking a question, we are getting some feedback. Thank you. Does anyone in the room have a question? Not right now. Putting everyone on the spot here. <laughs> With that, um, um, we do have one question right now. Yeah, and if I can figure out how to bring it back up. Uh, I can't see it right now. It's hiding. Okay. Our hospital is currently accredited by DNV. Is that sufficient as an accreditation as far as new law is concerned? Um, I don't know. I mean, I personally don't know what you guys usually, if you're accredited, what you do. But um, 
right now we don't know what's going to be sufficient accreditation because the Board of Pharmacy hasn't given us their list of approved accrediting agencies. But until then, we still have the fallback because um, the statute says that you either have to be accredited or you have to make some sort of showing that you're following um, USP guidelines. So until we get that list from the Board of Pharmacy, um, we can fall back on the USP. But I think that, um, you know, uh, that might be something that you talk about with the Board of Pharmacy as they're drafting, um, drafting the regulations. What are, um, what do you guys as the experts in the industry consider appropriate uh, accrediting agencies? Okay, that's the only question that we have. Okay, anyone else on the on the webinar? Just so you know, you can either type the question in, or um, the phone lines are unmuted. So if you would like to have it more of an open discussion, feel free to unmute your phone and um, start talking to our speaker. Uh, let me quickly okay. thank you. Uh, you mentioned that there currently are no uh, outsourcing facilities licensed and or. Right. Registered in yeah, the state. I checked the list yesterday on the FDA's website, and um, no, no Michigan, no. Well, there may be. I mean, what they do is they list um, the name and they give a state, and I'm, uh, I'm assuming that maybe it could be where their headquarters are. But I know, like for instance, for Farm Medium, wherever they have a location where they actually do compounding, they list each one of those states, and so um, <clears throat> there's no physical location that's registered as an outpatient, uh, I keep saying outpatient, outsourcing facility in Michigan on the website. So I think that's one of the reasons why the Board of Pharmacy is not in a huge hurry to put together this um, uh, application for an uh, entity that wants to compound without prescriptions because right now in their mind they're only going to give it to people who are registered as outsourcing facilities and there are no Michigan entities in, you know, approved. However, I did, one thing that occurred to me actually after I got off the, the phone with the Board of Pharmacy is what do we do with the outstate entities that distribute their compounding that are registered, um, well I suppose if they're registered outsourcing facilities in another state, um, if they're, as long as they're registered with the FDA, they should be able to get that. But apparently, the board hasn't received any applications yet from those out-of-state registered outsourcing facilities. Okay. We have uh, quite a few more questions here from Sherry Dalzell. If a pharmacy prepare, prepares IV products under USP 797, do they have to add the new licensure for coding pharmacy with the state board? Yes, because that is compounding. I mean, they're considered... But you're going to be um, compounding. I mean, I think you should check the box for compounding because you're doing it. Um, you're doing it. You are compounding. Injecting one substance into an IV fluid is compounding. So you'll have to tell the board of pharmacy that you're doing it. I'm sure they expect all hospitals are doing that. But you're doing it with an order, with a prescription for the patient. So you're not going to need to fill out this. Um, application that you would use if you were doing it without an order. So you'll just have to indicate that on your uh, pharmacy application when you okay, when great. You fill it out. Uh, the next question comes from Carol Yarrington. Uh, we are a little confused. Is a hospital pharmacy that compounds just for patients in our hospital affected by these changes? Then also, do we need the additional compounding licensing from Michigan? You need... Um, as, as a hospital that compounds for its own patients, you're going to be, you would fall within, I think, the 503A, and then you're also going to follow, you're going to fall within, um, the, the new Michigan law does regulate you in that you're going to have to, um, you're considering, you're falling within the definition of compounding under the new law. Um, you're going to have to, you're already licensed as a pharmacy, so that's not a problem, and you're going to have to follow the, um, USP standards. You're going to have to make some sort of statement that you're following the USP standards. But unless you're doing it, what's called bulk compounding, you don't have to do that separate application. That's just for people who are doing compounding in, without a prescription, completely without a prescription. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Julie Schrantz. 
Uh, we regularly compound in anticipation of receiving scripts for hospice patients. Do we need to be, one, licensed in Michigan as a compounding pharmacy, or two, be licensed as a federal compounding pharmacy? And this is in regard to non-sterile products like magic repositories, or suppositories, sorry. I'm, I'm assuming that you mean, um, I'm not sure if you, you, you are a licensed pharmacy already, I'm assuming. We, it doesn't say. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you already are licensed. You're, you'll see when you fill out your application that there's a new spot that says that you have to, um, that you are doing compounding. They are a licensed pharmacy. Right. And yeah. um, so you are, you are regulated by this law, but you're probably already doing everything that you need to do because you're not doing it. Um, eventually, all those hospice patients will have a prescription that they can show to you you're not going to have to get these special um, without a prescription approval um, that you would under Michigan law. And you don't have to register under federal law. That's only outsourcing facilities that have the option to register. Okay. 503 compounding pharmacies do not have to register under federal law for okay. the FDA. Great. All right. The next question is from Kathy Pawlicki. Uh, we prepare sterile Kefzal sy syringes and distribute them to partner hospitals within our system. What impact does this legislation have on our practice? I don't think that, um, I guess that you, you know, I'm assuming that you're going to be following USP and you have your pharmacy license. I think you'll be okay because, again, you're only, you are, um, you're just, you're sending it out to entities that are just giving it to their own patients. I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about entities under common control. Um, so you can say they're your quote own patients. Um, you're not sending, you're not selling it to other legal entities, uh, other hospitals across town. Um, so I don't think that, that there's anything wrong with what you're doing. I don't think that there's, I don't, I'm not sure that there's any huge impact on the Michigan law for what you're doing other than very clearly now it says you are compounding, you have to follow the USP, um, <clears throat> and you will have to indicate on your, you will have, because you're doing sterile compounding, you're going to have to show that you're accredited or you're in the process of becoming accredited by these agencies or that you're following um, USP standards. You'll have to make that showing to the Board of Pharmacy next time you do your license. Okay, wonderful. Uh, the next one comes from Nicholas Gentle. Uh, how does the Michigan law deal with central fill within a health system? Yeah, I, I guess within a, a single health system, which is sort of like what Kathy was just talking about, yeah. where you're just doing it. But the hospitals will have separate licenses. Yes, they'll have separate licenses. But I think as long as, um, because the you have to have a separate license for each physical location where you're dispensing or you're filling prescriptions. So um, I think that that there's nothing really other than the accreditation issue and that you'll have to indicate that you're compounding now because they revised the, um, the application. I don't see that there's any problem with doing that because um, you are going to get patient prescriptions because you're doing it still within your organization. You're not selling it out to, uh, you know, you have control. You know that um, that it's only going to be dispensed or, or administered, I should say, to a patient that's your patient. So I don't think that there's going to be any huge impact. It'll be interesting to see, though, when they actually write the regs, if they're going to deal, because I think this is one of the the gray areas, is where you've got multiple pharmacies, multiple hospital pharmacies, all under the same sort of corporate umbrella. They each have their own license. You know, if they send it over to, um, you know, another building that's under the same corporate control, is that really selling it to somebody else? I don't think so. I mean, because when you look at, like, for instance, if you're sort of Looking for an analogy, if you look at what's allowed under the Prescription Drug Marketing Act, if you're an enti entities under common control can sell drugs to each other without violating that. So um, I'm not saying that that's exactly what the pharmacy is going to ultimately say, but it seems like it's sort of in the pattern of what. Um, it's not so much that um, these these new federal 
or it's not that the federal law or the new Michigan law is trying to regulate or um, change the way in which pharmacies that compound for their own patients are doing business. That's not the goal. They're putting some extra little safeguards in place, like the USP standards and the accreditation. But what, they're, what the new law is trying to do is get to distinguish those from these entities that are um, compounding in bulk that don't have patient prescriptions. Those are the ones that are going to be hit the heaviest by the new Michigan law. So if you're, if you're a hospital pharmacy and you're, you're making these Capsule injections or you're putting TSM supplements into an IV, you're doing TPN, whatever, it's not so much a big effect on you, um, but it's these entities that are doing it without a prescription that are the, the main, um, they're going to feel the brunt of that. Okay. With regards to uh, preparing, say, Tesla or Cephasmin, mm -hmm. IV syringes or piggybacks. Uh, is that really compounding or is that just reconstitution? Well, I guess if um, if you're doing, if you're going beyond what the actual instructions say, you know, I mean, instructions for the user, not mm -hmm. for the pharmacy, instructions for the user. If, if, if somebody could take it home and do it at home, I guess I'd say that's not compounding. But if it's something that you need the equipment in the pharmacy or you need some sort of special expertise to do that goes a little bit beyond what the instructions in the package insert say, then I think that would be kind of Okay, because like making a cefazolin uh, syringe or mm -hmm. piggyback is just merely reconstituting or adding uh, sterile water to the vial and just withdrawing, withdrawing it and injecting it, it into yeah. multiple IV piggybacks. Yeah, but is that something that you'd let a patient do at home? Perhaps. Yeah. 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 It could be somewhere. right. I mean, some mm -hmm. some things. I guess that sort of. I mean, I haven't seen that written anywhere, but that sort of would be my thing. Is this something that you could do at home? Um, uh, I'm trying to think of something that's like that people frequently have to reconstitute at home. Nothing's coming to my mind. <laughs> As I said, I don't like home county. A question on the entities, on the pharmacies that will not be able to compound it for resale to other pharmacies. Um, when, uh, that, like, how effective is it? Um, how how effective is it that I should expect not to be able to receive shipments from that pharmacy? Well, like, how, like when is it going to go into effect? Oh well, it's supposed to be in effect now. Okay. But um, but like I said, the. Uh, when I spoke with the Board of Pharmacy last week, um, there are no regs yet. They did issue that memorandum, sort of summarizing the law, but sometimes it takes a while for the regulatory agency to catch up with the statute and to write the regs and mm -hmm. and think about how they're going to enforce it. You know what? Um, okay. So I wouldn't be looking for hot and heavy enforcement right now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Glenn Monroy, you have your hand raised. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, so this is actually Bob Loveland. I'm on the conference with Glenn. I'd like to ask two questions, please. Um, can an inpatient pharmacy reconstitute an IV product for Capsol in normal saline piggyback and uh, transfer that to the outpatient pharmacy for sale to the public pursuant to a prescription? So you have the inpatient pharmacy and they get a prescription? Actually, the outpatient pharmacy would have received a prescription. That's kind of the central fill question that you asked. I think that if you have a prescription and you're following the, um, you know, so you're saying that the, the outpatient pharmacy just transmits the prescription to the inpatient pharmacy to do the dispensing, and then they just actually uh, physically send it over to the outpatient pharmacy where the patient picks it up? No, actually the, the outpatient pharmacy would dispense it through their computer system. The inpatient pharmacy actually would just compound the medication for the outpatient pharmacy or prepare it for them. Yeah, I think, th I think that's okay as long as you're following all of the, um, you have the prescription and you're following all the compounding um, 
you know, if it's sterile, you're following those rules. Um, and you're, if, if, I mean, it sounds sort of like central fill, but maybe I'm not understanding it. I, they have two separate licenses. Right. That happens with central fill. So I guess as long as you're otherwise following the requirements in the um, public health code and in the pharmacy regs, I don't think that what this law is doing is going to impact that at all. Okay. Um, my other question is there, there seems to be a contradiction in the law. The definition of compounding excludes the preparation of a product that um, is essentially equivalent to a commercially available product. Yeah. With the exception. Then it goes on and says that you can't compound a commercially available product. So the the example I use is vancomycin solution. We compound that frequently in the outpatient setting in the hospital. There is a product available commercially called First Vanco. And so my question is, are we bound to purchase that product in suspension? Or can we compound vancomycin solution as we have done in the past using the injectable preparation? So I'm, I'm sorry, so you're saying that there's there's a commercially available oral product, right? Oral, oral product, product, right? Oral product. Oh, that's Yeah, that would follow the exception because it's a different, but you said you're reconstituting an injectable? And giving it orally. Yeah. And, and giving it orally. Yeah, the, the cost yeah, to prepare is. oral vancomycin solution, so basically, um, and that's you know, it, it's the same, same thing as the commercially available Still medically available? available like it, it works. <laughs> okay. Same ingredients. Same ingredients, and you can take it orally. If there's nothing about the GI tract that's going to destroy the. No. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't get absorbed, so it doesn't matter. Well, I guess if you can, I, I think you could fit into that exception where if the physician feels that it's appropriate for the patient. I don't think the physician knows what cares whether well, you're yeah. using an IV product or. But don't they usually put. The so route of delivery. The that is one route. thing I remember from Pharma County. Yeah. <laughs> the route of delivery. Route, on there. But the yeah. product is usually selected it's by the, the same. pharmacy itself. But I, I don't think there's a problem if you, I mean, if it's within, if you think it's standard of care to do that, to deliver the drug that way, to, to dispense it to the patient, I don't think there's anything about this drug because you're, you're compounding, you're compounding with a prescription. Right? You have a prescription for it. Um, well, it depends. It sounds like is if the only reason is that the commercially available product is more expensive. I wonder if that is an issue. If you can find some other reason, like it is not readily available as yeah. quickly to the patient, or the physician um, wants it to come from the source that you use, right. that seems like that it would justify it. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, if you could do, if you could go the availability, or um, you might have to find some legitimate way to document right. that you're using. Yeah, right. it's, it's mainly done for cost reasons. That would be right. That probably isn't going to be. Oh, no. I guess. Um, so, and the physicians writing PL. They want this given okay. PL. Yeah, I think the probably run a usage report and start, you know, encouraging like so many per week or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. And what what does the insert say? Does the insert say that you can only give that powder form IM? I'm sure it just says IM IV. IV. I think is all only says. This practice has been going on for, for a long time. For a very long time mm -hmm. before there was an oral solution or an oral uh -huh. even capsule available. And uh, that so might be I mean if if it's strictly a money thing, then I guess all we can say is that it doesn't fit into the exceptions right now that we see in the statute, unfortunately. But Okay, thank you. Maybe it's an issue <laughs> to talk about with the board of pharmacy. Um, Parmpreet, do you have some questions? Um, yes, we typed two questions in. Can you see the questions that we sent? Yep, I didn't know since you had your hand raised. I didn't know if you wanted to ask them. Um, but yeah, I can read them for you. Um, 
So the first one is, how does the new law apply to compounding in a physician-based clinic for administration to their own patients, such as in an oncology infusion center that is not licensed as a pharmacy? Yeah, the, the new law, um, I, I may not have in these um, slides said this, but the, the new law allows prescribers to compound to, for their own patients. So okay. it would not really affect your ability to do that um, if you're just doing it for your own patients. You might have to get a, uh, um, what's it called, a drug, drug control registration for, for dispensing prescribers. So they would have to yeah. be licensed as a dispensing prescriber. Yeah, they prescriber. Would, they, you should probably get a license as a dispensing prescriber, but that's, you know, that's been, that requirement's been around a long time. So. Okay, uh, another one. Um, I'm curious about the restriction for compounding commercially available products in a hospital setting. Particular items such as compounding electrolyte solutions or antibiotic doses when such products may be commercially available as pre-made products from the manufacturer. I think one, um, yes, like we said that there are stated exceptions and one of them has to do with uh, availability and timeliness and certainly um, you know that could be an issue in the hospital that you can you can make an argument I think that it's more readily available um, you if you're talking about uh, yeah I don't know I mean I can remember doing that myself <laughs> I didn't want to wait until the pharmacy sent up the bag with the potassium supplement you know because you so you just you know I'm sure people don't do that anymore in hospitals but um, you know you'd make up your own little potassium supplement because a half an hour the patient couldn't wait that long. And so, uh, and you didn't have a stock of it. So I think in a hospital setting you could make some legitimate arguments that, um, for availability. And you're doing it for your own, um, you're doing it for your patients. And uh, I, I think frankly that's, um, that's an issue that the Board of Pharmacy is going to have to come to grips with. That in the hospital setting, um, a lot of times your uh, your um, your compounding stuff just as an expedient, and it might be something that's commercially available. Maybe it's an area that you want to talk to the board of pharmacy about to get clarity and and uh, you know as they write their regulations to be a little proactive in that area. Rachel Liu, are you on the line and do you have a question? Yeah, raise your hand and take a little follow-up question. Oh, no, our question was answered earlier. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. Um, Sura Abdullah, do you have a question? Okay, well, we've got one last question here in the window, and that is if I have trained technicians and check each ingredient... <laughs> If I have trained technicians and check each ingredient, are they allowed to compound? We have technicians compounding topical and oral products, and they have special training and testing for sterile compounding. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there was no allowance for delegation in the rules. Yeah, you know, right now the rule talks, the, re the statute talks about um, the pharmacist doing the compounding. And uh, uh, what... You know, I don't. I don't know that we know the answer to that question yet. I think that um, that might be another area that you're proactive with the regulations on is some clarity because the public health code does allow um, some delegation. Um, you know, for licensed health professionals can delegate duties to people who have who have been trained to do them. That's how you know uh, nurse practitioners work, and certainly you know if you've got a, a way to credential these techs that might be an area where the, um, the pharmacy board would allow, allow that to be done. Right now, the statute just says, um, says pharmacist, and I suppose you could overlay that supervision delegation stuff, but I haven't really looked back into the, I don't think that there's any um, restrictions on, um, right now in the regs that, that say, you can delegate this, you can't delegate that. I haven't seen anything like that in the pharmacy context. So um, I, think you, I think you'd want to make sure, like you are, that 
you've got some qualified people who've met some sort of training and that you've got a supervision system in place. Um, and that probably that your pharmacist is, is physically present there, which is required anyway. So. Okay. And we don't have any more questions in the chat window. Does anyone on the line have any questions? Yes, we do, actually. Go ahead. This is a follow-up to thank my question. So, the package insert for injectable vancomycin actually provides instructions on making oil solutions. I'm sorry, so as long as it, it puts what? It, it, the package insert has instructions on how to prepare and use the injectable product mm -hmm. for oral therapy and oral solutions. So as long as the product comes with instructions on how to compound it and use it in that manner, then we're okay to continue to do that and not have to buy an alternative commercial product that's of an oral form. And, and those are instructions that are, are, are intended for the ultimate user? Yes. Okay, then well, I don't even think they'd be compounding them. No, 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 no. no. Uh, well, it's in the package insert. It's in the package insert. So, so it's something. For the injectable, sorry, for the injectable product, there's a section for oral administration that goes over how to compound and administer the intravenous product orally. This is just a question from my information. Would you ever dispense a, a, not, a, a not yet constituted powder to a patient and say, here's the instructions on how to do it at home and take it orally? No. No, probably not. But if it's included in the package insert, that means that each package insert is reviewed by the FDA right. and has to be right. FDA approved. So to me, if it's in the package insert, it would seem that that is the intent, that's one of the intended ways yeah. of administering the drug. Right, right. So I'm sure, so I guess I'm not even sure if that's, um, I, I don't even think we're in the category of commercially available then, because it is, okay. it's, it's, another it's another use for it. Yeah, so you're not doing okay. it in equivalent. So I think we're okay with okay. that. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions on the line? I have a question. Go ahead. I have a, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, my name's Matt. I'm uh, a pharmacist of a non-resident pharmacy license in Michigan. We do home infusion of IV antibiotics uh, pursuant to a physician's prescription, uh, patient-specific. Do I have to do anything else, like 503B? I don't fall in that nope. category. I don't nope. feel. No, nope. if you're. I'll just say. Go ahead. I was just saying, if you are not, you always have a prescription, so you're not, uh, you're not um, an outsourcing facility, and that new step about getting an app, you know, getting approval by, um, by the Michigan Pharmacy Board is for the 503B category of provider, not for the pharmacy that compounds in with a prescription. So you should not have to do anything other than when you go to do your renewal for your license application, you'll have to indicate that you're a sterile, that you compound sterile products. You'll have to make the showing about um, accreditation or in the process of being accredited or compliance with USP. But otherwise, that new category of you have to get a, make an application, make approval, that's for the 503B outsourcing facility people. So you should be okay. That's what I thought. And then one other question I had. So like the Fazolin, uh, that drug is commercially available in a, a mini bag that you don't have to do anything with it except open up the foil bag. However, we use the Fazolin 10 gram vial that the FDA has seen the package insert and says instructions how to reconstitute it and to, to give the final concentration and then what to withdraw. I, that's fine to use that too, correct? even though there's commercially available fabulous. Yeah, I think so, because they're giving you, it's just, uh, you're not trying to create something that's commercially available. You're getting the commercially available thing, and you're just following the instructions. If that's what it sounds yeah, like you're we're doing. Not, yeah, we're not taking any raw material. Or anything right. Like we're we're low, low to medium risk if we do CPN in the home. Uh, 
call. That's, I just wanted some clarification. Yep. I think you're right. Thank you so much. Kathleen? Yes. And we, have, we have one more question here. So, a um, company like Finanium, they offer um, anesthesia, OR, syringes, specialty syringes. Right. Some of the products that they have are by concentration and by size, like, you know, I don't know, like fentanyl, 50 micrograms, you know, it's the exact same size of a commercially available product. The only thing different about it, it's color-coded to the anesthesia standards for labeling, and it's pre-drawn into a syringe. Mm -hmm. I, you know, is that mm -hmm. so acceptable to purchase in Michigan? You know, I, I'm, like, this is a new law, and we, we haven't really defined the boundaries of what you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, okay, now, what they're doing is not really commercially available because you can't buy a drug in that dose with that labeling and those, you know, sort of systems. So I, I think you could po it's possible you could make an argument that what they're doing, there's no commercial equivalent for it. Okay. But I don't, I'm not, I'm just saying that's an argument. I don't know if the Board of Pharmacy is going to buy that argument. They haven't really defined commercially available to that detail. Yeah. Along those same lines, I mean, I've got commercially available. It, it, it doesn't change the ingredients any way, shape, or form. Just putting it up into a different device right. that has right. a different color and label on it. Yeah. So if that were to be said to be okay, then there's no reason why any other commercial Available product, we could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that's why I question this. I guess uh, my, I, I would, I mean, if I were their lawyer, I would want to get some sort of, I would ask the question to the Board of Pharmacy and say, what do you think? Is this commercially available? I would tell the Board of yeah, Pharmacy I mean, okay. what answer I want. Right, right. I mean, <laughs> but you, always, you have to be careful. When you ask a question, you have to be willing to live with the answer. But I have think, a I have, yeah, yeah, you make an argument to them, you just don't. It seems them. like all of these commercially available questions, before you do what you think you've always done, make sure you think about what your rationale is right. that will fit into the defined exception. Yes, exactly. And and that's why I think when um, uh, when we're talking about the, the regs aren't developed yet, and a lot of times they'll have better definitions for th words like commercially available and so maybe that's an area where they, where you're proactive about trying to help the Board of Pharmacy formulate that definition so that you know you can continue to do what's reasonable and safe and just makes sense for everybody. I mean that is the goal. Yes, okay, so kind of along those lines, if I'm a pharmacist in charge here and we purchase those from Pharmatium, okay, and Pharmatium has their pharmacist in charge from Michigan or whatever, and the board comes in and inspects me and says, you can't be purchasing these, that's against the law, they're, um, that's not, those products are not, cannot be used because it's commercially available products, which pharmacist in charge is liable? Is it the pharmacist? charge for the pharmacy that's purchasing the product or is it the pharmacy in charge for the company selling the product? I, I believe it would be the the it would be the seller, the actual the entity that's doing the compounding because the way this is set up is that um, all of the requirements are, are requirements for the compounding pharmacy. They're not going to okay. blame, uh, they're not going to, they might take your drugs away or they might seize them or um, something like that, um, but I don't think you have a responsibility to decide whether or not your vendor is, um, you might want to, you know, I, that's another thing I know that the, um, uh, what is the acronym, the American Society for Hospital Pharmacists yes, has on their website a mechanism, uh, a, a, like a, checklist or an evaluation tool when you're trying to buy um, 
compounded drugs from an outsourcing facility or a manufacturer or some other um, some vendor. They have a, a system on there that they put together, actually I think with our medium's help, <laughs> for evaluating an outsourcing, outsourcing uh, facility or a vendor that you're buying compounded sterile products from, which might be helpful for you and, and hopefully it will address some of your concerns about, because um, you, yes, you might not be held liable, but you certainly don't want to be caught up in something where you're administering unsafe products to your patients or you're dispensing things that weren't, you know, compounded in accordance with the law. So um, that might be a useful tool to use that website. And, and Parmedium is registered as a 503B. They are, person. yes. In all of their locations, I'm pretty sure are registered. But I know they've been pretty pretty proactive with the FDA, especially in, during that time period when um, uh, we didn't have 503B and trying to, you know, because they were doing a lot of compounding in bulk without prescriptions and it was this gray area. So they were trying to set some standards for, you know, what's a legitimate and safe practice until they got some uh, guidance from the FDA. But that is a tool I think that could be useful for our hospitals. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you guys so much and be on um, the lookout for the PowerPoint, um, the advisory bulletin and the link if you would like to review um, the webinar that took place today. Thank you so much for participating.